attend to my Shvita, Darren. <coughs> Speaking of painting, I could use a little paint at my age, you know. I could use a little fixing up here. But, uh, yeah, I think it's 25 years now. I, I, I think I've been here since uh, the year 2000. So it's an honor and a privilege to uh, be, with, be, be with you all today. Um, it's time to D-T-R. You do know what that stands for. Huh? Det detox. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, what's the first question ever asked in the Bible? This is a Bible church, I think. B, B, C. The first question is? Where are you, Adam? That's the first question. What was God doing? He was defining the relationship between he and Adam and Eve, who he breathed into them the breath of life, and they became living souls, just like we were singing. How is it with your soul today? How is it with your relationship with him? You know, Jesus ma asked many questions, but he, he asked his disciples one day, who do people say that I am? And so they said lots of things. But he says, who do you say that I am? He was defining his relationship with them. I started thinking here the other day, uh, okay, Jesus had all kinds of people that he ministered to and so forth. What, what, what type of people were they? Well, some were fools. You know, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But there were many people who saw what he did and so forth, and they, they, they just wouldn't believe. Then there were frauds, like Judas. Three and a half years, he saw everything, heard everything, and so forth. But, but he betrayed uh, the Savior of the world. Uh, then there are friends. But you see, even his brothers were not believing in him. His own brothers and sisters. So you can be a friend. You can be close by in a relationship, you know. But, and then for sure there were foes, huh? The scribes, the Pharisees, they wanted and they cried out, crucify him. But Jesus had lots of foes. And then, of course, there are fans of Jesus. Uh, if you guys follow the Euro League, maybe some of you gals do too, you've, you've got your own team, and you, and you sit there and you cheer on TV or whatever else it might be. Uh, there are those that are on in the game, and they're playing, and then there's the spectators. There's lots of fans, and they have all kinds of critique on the game, of course. Huh? So there's many fans of Jesus as he walked. They were mesmerized by what he did, his teachings, his healings, the different things and so forth that he did. But Jesus wants to define our relationship with him, what he wants us to be, our followers. Check it out. Define your relationship with Jesus this morning. Jesus is looking for a particular kind of follower, those who are willing to deny themselves and pick up their cross and follow him. You follow me, he says, and I'll make something of your life. I'll make you a fisher of men. I want to make your life count. The title of what I want to share with you this morning, and uh, thank you, worship team, for uh, I gave a little heads up, pick some songs that talk about some struggles, some trials. Of course, you all look so happy and everything. I'm sure you, you, you don't have them like us Americans, you know. Our country's just running smoothly. It's, it really is. We've got elections coming up, and, and it, it'll, it'll just be a piece of cake. Uh, no. Now, so what I want to share with you this morning is, is called discovering and the, especially the key word, developing night vision. There's lots of wars that are going on. We all know about the Middle East. We know about what's happening in Ukraine and Russia and all of that. But if it was pitch black in here this morning, you could not see your hand in front of your face. But our military would come with night goggles and they would be able to see in the dark because they have night vision. Why do they do that? For what particular uh, purpose? 
Well, it's for tactical advantage. We couldn't see, but they can see. It's for situational awareness of what's happening and what's going on. You have to be able to have superior visibility. And these night goggles that we have, they are for surveillance, they're for intelligence, they're for search and rescue. Military night vision. But what I want to talk to you about is not that kind of night vision for us wearing a particular kind of goggles, although we want to look through the lens of Scripture. And what I want to share with you today is about the life of, of David. But when you think of night vision, do you remember this account in 2 Kings chapter 6? The army of Aram, the king of Aram, has surrounded God's people. And uh, Elisha's servant, <laughs> he, he, he said, hey, we're, we're in big trouble here. And then he prays and he says, or he says, alas, my master, what shall we do? Don't fear. We just finished singing a song about that. Don't fear, for those who are with us are more than those that are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. He needed some other kind of vision. That the Lord opened a servant's eyes, and the king saw, and behold, and they won a great victory. This invisible realm of spiritual beings that were there on their side. We just finished singing a song, He is with us. But there's something even better than Him being with us. It's Him within us. Because that's Christianity. Christ in meity and Christ in unity. <clears throat> because this is what the scriptures tells us. If you do not have the Spirit of God here this morning, you don't belong to Jesus. You can come to church, you can sing a few songs, you can put something in the offering, but you need to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And so Paul writes, and he says, now we have received. Is that past tense or present? It's past tense. We have received, not the spirit of this world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. And when the Holy Spirit comes into our life, our military uses night goggles, but we have the Spirit of God within. And Jesus talks, especially in 14 and 16 of John, about the Spirit of God. And what is he going to do? Jesus said when the Spirit of God comes, he's going to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment, just like he did me at age 30. Then what? Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's not going to talk about himself. He's going to talk about me, and he's going to bring to your remembrance all that I said. So the purpose, one of the purposes of the Holy Spirit is to reveal Jesus to your heart and your life and your need for him. Not just in the past, today. And then the scriptures, he works in our heart, and he does cause us to be born again to the to a living hope, just like Nicodemus needed to be born again. You've got to be born of the water and the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, Jesus said he's going to teach you, he's going to guide you, he's going to comfort you, he's going to come alongside, he's going to be a paraclete to you when you go through the valley even of the shadow of death. And he's going to empower you. You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, just wait. And so they waited, and the Holy Spirit came. And then the Holy Spirit transforms us from the inside out as we behold him as in a mirror, as in the word of God. We're changed from one degree of glory to another by the Lord, the Spirit. So I want to illustrate it this morning through the life of, of David. If you remember Saul, the Spirit of God came on Saul mightily, and he prophesied, and then uh, he didn't follow the Lord and he disobeyed, uh, sadly. And the Spirit, Holy Spirit was taken from him, and an evil spirit came upon him. And Samuel comes now, and Samuel anoints David as king. 
sons of Jesse, the last one, they bring him in here. We do not know exactly how old David was, maybe 15, 16, 17 in there, because we know he came into power and began to reign in Hebron at age 30. So he's anointed king, and the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit came upon him mightily, and he was a man after God's own heart. So imagine yourself being 17, a prophet comes, the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you are going to be king. You are going to lead this people called Israel. So you'd think that things now are going to run fairly smoothly, right? <laughs> uh, not at 17. God has to do a little bit of training, a little bit of preparation. And uh, so I want to share some training, some preparation that he's done in your life and he's still doing in your life. And the first one is the wilderness of spiritual preparation. David spent his life out herding sheep, goats, cattle. I don't know all that he was, but he was out there. He was alone. And he did this. Whoop, sorry about it. I want to back up one. Uh, from Psalm 78, notice what he did. Notice the verbs that are underlined. The first three. He chose David, his servant. He took him from the sheepfolds, from the care of ewes with suckling lambs. He brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people. This is his church. It's not Darren's church. It's not Cassandra's church. It's not the elders' church. It's his church. There's only one church. Nothing's going to stop it. Huh? And he brought him, chose him, took him, brought him to do a specific task. That's what we're to do as pastors and elders and leaders and other ministry leaders. We shepherd, whether it be children, the kids left here, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. Now notice how he did it. He shepherded them. That's what we're to do, dads, moms, with our own children. You don't just leave that to the church. You shepherd your children and your grandchildren, one generation to the next to the next. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart, and he guided them with his skillful hands. His spiritual preparation is out herding sheep. <laughs> but what did he learn out there herding sheep? He learned dependence. He learned that he needed to be led by the Lord to green pastures and quiet waters. He needed to have faith. It's where he developed his love and an intimacy that he had with the creator of the universe. The heavens declare the glory of God, he says in Psalm 19. He had a love affair with God's creation, and he had a love affair with, with Yahweh himself. He had one desire, according to Psalm 27, 4, that he would dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of his life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. He wanted to see the Lord. That kind of intimacy. Intimacy is defined as a growing relationship that develops through long association. It's been 50 years now for me. As the Lord saved me when I was 30. I'm, I'm uh, 80 now. <clears throat> He's been so gracious and good to me. I know maybe about this much of what I should know. But I have a passion and a desire to continue to grow until I take my last breath or my heart stops. That will happen at the same time. <laughs> Out there in the wilderness, he learned resourcefulness and resilience. It's resilience is getting back up when you're knocked down. You've been knocked down a few times? Come on, you've been knocked down, but you're not knocked out. You get back up again. And the Lord upholds us with his, with his hands. So David had to learn this, and he learned those things just herding sheep. He had courage and boldness out there. Goliath was a nobody. <laughs> How can you do this? Hey, when I was out there in the wilderness, the lion, the bear, I just disposed of them. Yeah, go to Monopools and try that out once. See how that works with, with, with a lion. See if he doesn't have lunch uh, there instead. And so David learned these things. Listen, friends. In silence and solitude. There's little silence and solitude these days in most of our lives. I live three kilometers from Apple, a few more from Google and Facebook. 
Our average teenager spends seven hours a day on his devices. Who's discipling who? The IT world is discipling our young people, and not only young people, our old people. I go here to a coffee shop. There'll be uh, out for dinner, and there's a mom and a dad, and uh, they're both texting. Their two children are sitting there like this. What is that? Huh? Take the phone and toss it somewhere. These are your kids, and you're out to dinner uh, with them. Be present. Now, don't let the world squeeze you into its pattern of thinking, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So here's darkness lesson number one. Remember when you, we, uh, before we had phones with pictures, you had to develop the film in the, the dark. <laughs> Faith is like film. It's developed in the dark, the dark days, the nights that make you trust God and in ways you normally would not be able to to trust him. He takes us, consider it all joy when you go through various trials. You clap your hands when you're going through them? The testing of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing, that you may mature and grow. What a sad situation if we saw a 16 year here over here still in nappies and sucking on a bottle. <laughs> he wants us to grow and, and mature. All right, so David's going to be king, huh? He's anointed by the Spirit of God, and then what is he doing? He starts dodging spears. What's up with that? Saul has an evil spirit, and so they call David in, and he plays his harp or whatever, and calms Saul down and so forth like that. And so God uses the fiery furnace of affliction in your life, in my life, to draw us close to him. So David would say in the in the Psalm 119, it was good that I was afflicted that I might learn your ways. He would say before I was afflicted, I went astray. Ah, but now I keep your word. Also Psalm 119, in faithfulness you afflicted me, Yahweh. I think six times in Psalm 119, the word affliction is used. And so, Psalm 86, in the midst of affliction, what do you do? You cry out. That's the way you get into the kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's the only way you get into the kingdom, is to cry out to God for forgiveness. So incline your, O Lord, answer me, for I'm afflicted and needy. I had two prayers when I first became a Christian. One, give me hunger for the scriptures, the book, and secondly, whatever it takes to keep me at a point of need. And believe me, God knows how to keep you needy and humble and on your knees. Save your servant who trusts in you. Be gracious to me. God is preparing him to be king. Here's a darkness lesson number two. When the darkness you're experiencing is God-ordained, not from your own stupidity and sin, do not try to create your own light. Learn to be content where he has you. We want to wiggle out sometimes of situations. And God says, I want to teach you some things in the valley of the shadow of death. Paul learned to be content. It's a process where you learn contentment, where you learn to trust, when you learn that I can handle this situation through Christ who strengthens me, who's in me. Number three. Whoops, I flipped through one too many. Remember, he's 15, 17, somewhere in there. He's going to be king at age 30, and then he's hiding in caves. <laughs> Lord, I thought I was going to be king right here, and, and now Saul's got 3,000 people down there, and I'm hiding out in the caves with a few of my men. 
I call it terrific cave of emotional darkness. And many think that Psalm 13 was written when he was hiding out in one of these caves. I want you to note the number of how longs. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? You cry out and nothing happens. How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? A long time sometimes. Have you ever noticed that God's ways are not your ways, that his timing is different than your timing? Hello? Are you with me? You know these things. No, we just want, don't worry, be happy. I went to uh, one of the shops the other day, don't worry, go shopping. <laughs> now, it's, it isn't all happy. Marriage is a piece of cake, right? It's a walk in the park. Raising kids, ah, got that one down pat. Oh, think again. No, we, God puts us through some desperate times so that we might know what he's like. You need to learn to get into the yoke with Jesus. And you'll learn that he is gentle and humble in heart. He's not harsh. He's not cruel. He's not trying, you know, <laughs> to do something that, that isn't for your best interest. No, not at all. Here's darkness lesson number three. This one is critical, friends. We all go through this. I just had a friend that we were missionaries with in Sri Lanka and the Philippines, a couple, they just buried their, their three-month-old grandchild. She, just a few days later, her 24-year-old uh, nephew died in a motorcycle accident, age 24, just got his paramedic license. Two funerals within a matter of days. When you can't find the answer for the darkness, trust the relationship. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own limited thinking and perspective. It's often in the worst moments that God gives you his best insights. Huh? Have you learned some things in the dark? That's why you need to develop night vision. I'm telling you, things are not going to get better in our world. There's not going to be some peace treaty in, in Israel where everything's going to be nice. They have been fighting since Ishmael and Isaac, and they will continue. No peace treaty will ever be kept until the Prince of Peace returns. So David comes into power. He reigns seven years at Hebron, and then he goes to Jerusalem. Saul's descendants reigned for seven years there in Jerusalem, and then they started coming to David from all the different tribes. Men did. Because he was a leader. He was a shepherd. <clears throat> so now he's king. Things are going to go smoothly, right, as king? Ah, it's going to be easy. Ah, no, no, no. He had enemies. In fact, in one place he says, you know, if I was just betrayed... Uh, by an enemy, that would be one thing. But I was betrayed by someone who used to sit at the table with me. You ever been betrayed? I've been betrayed several times in ministry. Not just little dinky things. I've had lies told about me. Hurts, pain, relationships. Look at what Psalm 59 says. For behold, they set an ambush for my life. You know we have enemies. You can't see them. They're called demons. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. He's the god of this world. He wants to set you up. He wants to see you fall. He wants to ambush your life, your relationships. Notice, fierce men launch an attack against me. Not for my transgression, for my sin. We'll see that 
the last one is because of David's sin that he experiences darkness. But this is not for my own sin. Oh Lord, no guilt of mine they've set up against me. Arouse yourself to help me and see. You'd surely think that they would embrace Jesus when they saw all that he did, right? Ah, no, 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 no. Now there's a barren road. The road we walk is the narrow way. Jesus said so. There's a broad way, and most people are on that. Few are going to find the narrow way. How do you know if you're on the narrow way? You have fruit in your life. You'll know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of God. Here's darkness lesson number four. When the days are dark, oftentimes the Lord is your only light. Walk in the light that you have. When your faith is weak, trust him to be your strength. You can endure this. You can hang on. When your future is foggy, the Lord's your hope. And it is an extraordinary hope. And we know our final destination. I got a ticket that says I'm leaving on Wednesday on an Emirates flight to Dubai and then 16 hours on to San Francisco. But my citizenship is in heaven. And I'm eagerly waiting for a Savior. He has a name, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's going to transform this humble body. I've got two new hips and I've got a pacemaker. I'm bionic. He's going to transform this humble body into conformity to the body of his glory by the power that he has to exert all things and subject all things to himself. Hallelujah. I got a great future. So do you. If you know the Savior. Here's the last. I call it the abyss. You know what an abyss is. It'll swallow you up. The abyss of sin and family pain. At a time when kings were to be out to war, David was there in Jerusalem, and he looks down, and he sees a very beautiful woman bathing. She happens to be the wife of one of his 30 mighty men, Uriah the Hittite. These were his choice guys. He finds out. He brings her up. We don't know what happened, if she, Bathsheba consented or if it was something other than that. We don't know. It's only conjecture. But we know what happens. She's pregnant. David calls Uriah back home from the battlefield. He wants him to come when he comes back and sleep with Bathsheba so that uh, they can cover up. You've never covered anything up, have you? You don't have any secrets, do you? You've never hidden something from your wife, have you? Money? Little things here and there? <laughs> oh, no, no. You're, you're, you belong to Bible Baptist Church. You're the, you're the holy church here. Yeah, yeah, okay. No, so then he gets him drunk. He still won't sleep with Bathsheba. Sends him back out. Put him on the front lines. So he murders one of his 30 mighty men. And then there's a fourfold curse that comes upon him by Nathan the prophet. The baby dies. Absalom steals the kingdom. There's incest in the family. And Absalom's going to sleep with all of his concubines. And he steals the kingdom from his dad. This isn't, by the way, Psalm 78. That's, that's the wrong thing there. Then the king trembled and went to the chamber. Absalom comes back, if you remember, and then he speared through, pierced through. 
And this is as he walked, he said, after he found out Absalom was dead and murdered, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you, Absalom, my son, my son. Imagine him now looking back, that one look at Bathsheba and that act that he did cost Here's the lesson, friends, for all of us. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked, if you remember from Galatians chapter 6. Whatever you sow, I grew up on a farm, plants, plant maize, you get maize, plant soybeans, you get soybeans, plant wheat, you get wheat, oats, you get oats, peas, you get peas. You're going to reap destruction. Your sin will find you out. That's an interesting verse, by the way. Your sin will find you out. No, it's not always covered. You can go to the grave with secrets in your family. But your sin will find you out in the fact that it's going to haunt you. If you cover things up, the joy of the Lord is my strength. No, 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 no. The joy of the Lord is not going to be your strength. Because you've covered things up. You're hiding things from God. You're hiding things from others. That's no way to live. You can't put your head down on a pillow at night. There should be nothing between you and the Savior now, today, tonight. When we stumble and fall, we all stumble in many ways. You ask for forgiveness. You get back up. Forgiveness is a way of life for us. So David, he sowed to the flesh, and then he wanted to pray for crop failure. No, 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 she's pregnant. She's going to have a baby. The impact of sin in human relationships will come back to haunt you even after repentance as it did with David. Such is life. I'll tell you a quick story and I'll shut up. Is it okay? Story about uh, bamboo. One day in a vast kingdom, <clears throat> there was a master of the, the garden, forest of trees. And the most beautiful uh, was one bamboo that stood out above all others. It was a beautiful tree. And uh, the Mr. Bamboo was just happy, knowing he was there by his master and shining and doing all he could, bowing down before him. One day his master comes <clears throat> and says, um, Bamboo, I want to use you. And Bamboo says, Well, it seems the day of all days. You're going to use me. I, the most beautiful of all the trees, the tallest, the biggest, and everything. Go ahead, use me for your glory. And then... He says, Bamboo, I must cut you down or I can't use you. Cut me down? Me, the most beautiful all in the garden that's here? He says, if I don't cut you down, I, I can't use you. And he grew kind of quiet in the garden. And then he said, well, go ahead and cut. And so he cut Bamboo down. Then he said, Bamboo, I cannot use you unless I hack off your branches. My branches? Not all my branches. Can't use you unless I cut off your branches. Well, then cut, Master. And so he cut off his branches. Bamboo, I want to use you but I can't use you until I cut out your heart. My heart? All that's inside me? Well, go ahead and cut. And so that's what he did. And then the master took Bamboo and took him up 
on a mountain where there was a big pond of water. And the water went through bamboo on down to the rice paddies and fields that watered those fields so that rice could grow. And here is the main point. In that day, bamboo, once so glorious in her stately duty, became more glorious in her, notice, brokenness and humility. For in her beauty she had life abundant, but in her brokenness she became a channel of abundant life to her master's world. You know what bamboo trees are like. you can water your garden. If you took a bamboo seed and you planted it today and you watered it and fertilized it, after one year, you wouldn't see a thing. After two years, you water, you fertilize it, you wouldn't see a thing. After three years, you water it and fertilize it, you wouldn't see a thing. After four years, you water it and fertilize it, you wouldn't see a thing. But in the fifth year, it starts to grow. And some say you can almost even watch it grow. It grows to a height of unbelievable number of meters. And all the while, while you don't see anything on the surface, its roots are growing down deep and deep and deep. And I'm going to go through these very quickly, but here's the night vision insights and principles from this. The Holy Spirit is working in your life, in my life, within, underground, so to speak. And he's producing in your heart and life many characteristics, patience, adaptability, resilience. He wants to grow you up. He's deepening our roots in the Lord Jesus and in the scriptures. He empowers us by the Holy Spirit to bear fruit. And he enables us through all of that to glorify our great God. The Christian life is all about his glory. It's not about you not about me, but it's about him. He's the savior of the world. He's the only forgiver of sins. The only reconciler of a lost humanity. He's the only one who atoned or could atone for our sins. He loves you with an everlasting love. You're not an accident. Your parents might not have planned you, but God did. And he longs to be gracious to you. He waits on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are those who long for him. And his eyes move to and fro here this morning and around the world. And he wants to strongly support those whose heart is completely his. His. I'm his. I'm not just anybody. I belong to him. I am in him. He is in me. That's not just good news, friends. That's great news. So, Father, thank you for my brothers and sisters here this morning. <coughs> Would you continue? Well, I don't have to ask even. You will continue the work you started in their lives. And you are at work in all of our lives to will and to work for your good pleasure. You give us the desire and then the strength and the power to carry on. What a wonderful, marvelous Savior, King, our Lord you are. You are pierced through as we take communion here. For our transgressions, you are crushed 
for our iniquities and the chastening of our well-being fell upon you, Lord Jesus. By your stripes, we're healed, we're free, broke us out of prison, broke the doors down to We just want to say thank you, Jesus. Amen.